try to get through per- three parables tonight. They're, they're shorter ones. They, they uh, definitely feel like they go together. Um, you know, they seem to be in the same context. They are in chapter 13, which goes along with everything else that we've been talking about so far. But there does seem to be a break. Uh, there's a point here where Jesus kind of walks away from the crowds and begins to speak only to His disciples. And, uh, and we'll see that in verse 36 here of chapter 13. It says that uh, He left the crowds and went into the house. And his parable, or his disciples came to him and said, "Explain to us the parable of the tares in the field." And and then after that, he goes into these other ones. But just again to keep the context, we went through the parable of the sower, and and this is where Jesus began with these um, teaching. You know, again emphasizing the perspective of the sower, uh, the one that is spreading the seed. And so you know that's that's important. There's a lot of lessons to kind of be gleaned from that account. But you know the 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 sower needs to be the priority there. And so with the parable of the sower, we learned that the seed's going to get scattered. Um, There's going to be basically four types of reactions to the Word of God as it's being proclaimed. There are going to be some who are like the wayside. And so they, they aren't going to they're really not going to hear it, but they're not really listening. That's the idea. And so it's in one ear, out the other. They're hardened to it. They're not going to respond to it. And so the, the evil one will snatch away what's been sown. And we talked about how the devil seems to do that uh, effectively with uh, distractions and people's priorities and, you know, and, and, and those sorts of things. Uh, the seed is going to get sown on three different soils that may produce a plant, which would be a Christian. And, you know, uh, and, and so one type of Christian in that scenario would be the rocky soil. And so they get excited about it. They're on fire for the Lord. They, they grow quickly, but because that it's on that ra- rocky shelf, there's, there's no way for it to grow deep roots. And so having no, uh, having no roots in themselves, they are scorched by the sun and they give up. And so when persecution arises because of the Word of God, which will happen, right? That's unavoidable in all accounts. Uh, so that they, are, they don't fall away because there's persecution. They fall away because when persecution comes, just like it will for everyone else, they don't have the roots and the foundation to continue steadfastly until the end. And so, uh, so they, they fall away. And then there's the soil that would represent um, the thorny soil, right? That's the, the soil where, the, again, the plant will grow, but, but also in their same life is growing everything else. And, you know, the, the thorns will choke out uh, that plant. It won't be able to produce fruit. It will eventually die out. And, you know, that's, the, that's the, the idea that, you know, our time is such a precious, you know, valuable thing. And everything, everybody... Everything wants a piece of it, right? I mean, your time isn't your own time. We, we act like, well, it's my time to do what I want. It's not. If you, if you aren't careful, if you don't plan it out, if you don't have boundaries, if you can't use the word no when people are trying to claim your time, you, you won't have it. It's not yours anymore. It's everybody else's. And so, you know, when and everything competes for the same thing, there, you don't, there's not enough of you to do that, right? And so... You have to figure out what's important with you and, and your family and your wife and your husband and your children. And you know, and you got to figure out where the Lord and where the church needs to fall in all of that. Uh, because if you leave it up in the air, the world will make sure that you don't have any time for that. And so the thorny soil is somebody whose lives are just too caught up in worldly things. And, uh, and so they die out. They get choked out by that. The third soil would be the good soil, which is what we all want to aspire to. It's what we're looking forward to uh, when we're being evangelistic and trying to spread the Word of God. We, we want to find the good soil, but uh, again, our job is just to spread the Word. Our job isn't to determine the type of soil. And you remember that. You know, you, we're not to be soil judges, okay? We are to spread the seed, okay? We can judge the, the fruit, you know, uh, the tree by the fruit, but we're not to judge the soil, okay? And so the, the soil, we are to spread the Word of God, and then people have to decide what they're going to do with that. That's not on you. It's not on me. We'll talk more about that today a little bit. Um, but it's important to know that so that we don't get discouraged. The good soil produces a tree. That tree produces roots and it gets strong enough that it can, it can produce and support the fruit. And that is what the farmer's looking for. And so in that parable, you know, four soils, three produce a plant. Only one plant produces fruit. And the only 
one that makes it, the only one the Lord is, is happy and pleased with is the one that produces a plant that produces fruit. And so huge lessons there for the Christian life. After that, he gets into the tares and the wheat. Okay, and uh, you know, and, and, and which is the parable of you know, uh, a farmer sowing good seed in his field and then an enemy sowing a, uh, not just a weed, but a specific weed that is meant to sabotage the farmer. And so it's a, it's a weed that, that grows about the same pace as the wheat. It looks exactly like the wheat. It's not evident that it's a weed at all until it's time to produce fruit. And then the, the tear becomes evident and the wheat becomes evident. So he goes on to explain that later. Okay, we'll, we'll, so we'll, we'll do this in, in context. After this, he gets into the mustard seed. The mustard seed, you know, everybody in Jesus' day would understand what a mustard seed is. It, it, a mustard seed is a small garden seed. It's planted and it produces a viney bush. I, I don't, that's what I would call it. What would you all call it? A shrub? <laughs> a, a viney bush thing, yeah. So I think that's the technical textbook name for it. Um, but everybody knows, everyone could have looked, they, they know what these things look like, they, know, they grow rapidly, they grow tall as far as garden plants are concerned. But Jesus talks in this parable about this, 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 uh, this mustard seed turning into something, it, turning into, growing into uh, a, a tree with large branches. Um, the birds, the same birds that snatched away the seed in the parable of the sower and the evil one that sowed the tares, the, that, the, the birds are going to find rest in the branches uh, and they're going to nest in these thick branches of this mustard seed. And so it seems to be a cautionary tale uh, warning us that the church, you know, it, it'll likely try to become something bigger than it should, right? It'll, 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 you know, man will get involved with it. Uh, we will pervert and twist the doctrine and we'll make it more inviting. We'll make it more seeker friendly. We'll make it more open than, than what, the, what the Lord intended it to be. And it will grow into some monstrosity that it never was intended to be. Um, then we have the story of this leaven. And again, you know, these two parables are often des- described as the widespread rapid growth of the church and you know the church is like that leaven that's hidden in the world and it's growing throughout the world and you know there's there's, there's some doctrinal problems with that some theological issues we're going to run into here uh, we talked about that is the church hidden no we're supposed to be salt light city on the hill you cannot be hidden is what jesus said in matthew chapter 5 we're to let men see our good deeds glorify our father who's in heaven um, the, this, this leaven was, was intentionally hidden in, in a very specific amount of flour. That amount of flour was the amount of flour that was used in the meal offerings of the Old Testament, which specifically were not supposed to include any yeast, any leaven. And so again, this is, this is a story not about the church being hidden in the world, but about worldliness hiding in the church. Okay? And, and so again, cautionary tale of what can come out of that. And then we come back to explain the tares and the wheat. Okay, and so the explanation of the tares and the wheat is that as long as there is the church, there will also be some imitation of the church that is planted by the devil that will seemingly look very similar to the church. The only way that we're going to be able to really tell the difference is what? what what's, being, what's being produced. And even then, our job isn't to eradicate the tare, right? Our job is to, our, our responsibility is just make sure that we are the wheat, Right? We are what the right seed produces. That's, that's all we can do in this story. right? And so this isn't a story, a parable about what to do about the tares or how to deal with the tares. It's basically reminding us to not be naive. right? Pay attention to yourself, to your doctrine, to your teaching, to your life. Uh, make sure that you don't uh, get confused, distracted, pulled away by that wolf in sheep's clothing, by the, uh, by the servants of, of the devil who masquerade as, as, as angels of light, those sorts of things. And so, anyway, that brings us up to <clears throat> where we're at today. Uh, we're going to start talking uh, about the hidden treasure. i uh, like to get into the, uh, the costly pearl, and then we'll talk about the dragnet. So, that's, that's our goal. We'll see if we make it. I think we will. Um, so again, before we read this, verse 36 tells us that these remaining parables of this chapter are spoken by Christ to his disciples with, without the crowds. The crowds have dispersed and left. And so um, anyway, here we are, Matthew 13, verse 44. The Bible says this, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which a man found 
and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Okay, so this is a, this, here's a classic, almost harmless, you know, maybe I should say that, maybe I shouldn't, seems like, it, you know, this is a good example. I've, I've talked to, talked to our, our Bible college students about this a lot, you know, that it, we got to be careful, you know, it's important to go through, you know, if you're, if you're a preacher, if you're a teacher, it's important to do verse by verse studies. Okay, you know, we went through the book of Malachi, word by word, verse by verse. You know, that, that's an that's a important way to go through the text. When I preach, I try to preach, you know, most of my sermons directly from the text. We start here and we just walk down the text. And it, why is it better to do it that way? As opposed to what? What are, what are my options? Topical. In context or out of it, uh, Topical, okay. So why would, why, would, why would teaching and preaching that way be better than topical? Exactly. You can, you can, you know, when you're doing topical stuff, you're trying to take, you're, you're looking for Scripture to back up the points you've already come up with, which is a dangerous game to play because you can make, you can find Scripture to support almost anything you want if you aren't going to stay in the context. And so you can lose the context. And I've, I've seen preachers, guys, even that I respect and, and have, a, you know, uh, appreciate a lot of the work they do, but I've seen them, I've seen them contradict themselves you know, because they say one thing one day and then the next week they're saying something else because, it, you know, that's, that's where their topical message went. Uh, I've seen them kind of miss the, 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 the big point of things because they're trying to hone. And there, is, there are some, some very dangerous doctrines that are even going through the brotherhood today. Now, I'm not talking about denominational groups, but among our churches that are, only exist because people went with an agenda and are trying to find Scripture to back up their ideas. And it's, it's a dangerous game to play. Not that there's not a time for it. Okay? There's, there's times when you need to deal with the topic and so you, you can put together a topical message. But here, these parables are good examples of, of especially this one, where we can take an idea, because this, this often happens. You, you can have an idea that's even a scriptural idea. It's a good idea. It's a biblical idea. But you're, we're not using the Scripture accurately to get to that idea. You get what I'm saying? So, so anyone listening isn't going to come out with the wrong idea, but we interpret, interpreted Scripture poorly. You know, it's not the point the Scripture was trying to make. And so here's an idea. You know, the kingdom of heaven's like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found, hid again, and from joy over it, he goes, he sells all that he has, he buys the field. Now, how many of us have heard this uh, described in the way that this represents an individual who finds Jesus, right? And, and the value of finding Jesus, is, it's so valuable that it would be worth getting rid of everything else in order to have Jesus in their life. Now, is that a bad idea? That's preachable. I mean, I preach on that kind of commitment, that kind of selfishness and self-sacrifice and, you know, that you have to, have to diminish and the Lord needs to increase. And, you know, and can we find Scripture that supports those ideas? You better believe we can. Let's, let's flip over to Philippians chapter 3. And, and the reason I'm doing this is because I want, I want us to be learning, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's not just enough to know what the Scripture says. We have to know how to approach the Scripture so that we don't run into these kind of problems in our own lives and with our own doctrine and theology. And I, I've been there. I've done it. I've made these mistakes. So don't think I'm above that. Um, I, but I've, I've learned from them a bit. And so, you know, but Philippians chapter 3, I, you know, I love this. You know, Paul's kind of given his uh, resume. Look, you know, look at verse 7. Uh, whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Okay, cool bit of Scripture here. I mean, it's, it, there's, you want to talk about commitment, you want to talk about uh, you know, going all out for the Lord, this is a great place to do it. And so Paul's looking at his life, had it made, right? I mean, as far as, as a... Uh, 
as a Pharisee, as far as a man, you know, following the law, uh, Paul really had anything that any Jew would have wanted, right? I mean, he had the right pedigree. You're right, he was a rising uh, star among the, uh, among the religious leaders of the day. I mean, he really had things well as far as that's concerned. Now, he gave up all of it, and now what's he got? He's got Jesus, okay? What's it come with? Is there a price tag on that? persecution, suffering. I mean, we can go there in, in Corinthians and read that whole account where he said, are they servants of Christ? I much more. And how many beatings and shipwrecks and left for hunger and robbed and dangers. And you know, he goes through that list. Not one of us would want to change places with Paul. We look at Paul, we lift him up. We say, man, here's a guy that lived a faithful life and what, a, what an effectual doer for the Lord. And that's a great thing. But you and I would not want to switch places with him. Not in a heartbeat. When you look at the things he went through, we don't want to go through that. But Paul was considering all of that and says it's so worth it that I would give up everything and I gave up everything so that I may know not just know Jesus but know him as my Lord is that different big difference between knowing who Jesus is and knowing him as your Lord right what's the difference yeah authority is the difference right I know who Jesus is versus I've humbled myself before him Right? So he has authority in my life. And Paul's saying there's value in that kind of a life. But it comes with suffering and, 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 and persecutions and all of those sorts of things. But he considers it all rubbish, literally garbage, right? That he could be, that he could have Christ. And so what a, what a cool idea of someone who, who was willing to give up everything in order to have what Jesus came to offer him. Now, do people need to give things up to be a Christian? You better believe they do, right? Your life is going to change, right? If you're going to follow Christ, your life is going to be vastly different, right? The way you think is going to be different. The things that are important to you need to be different. Your priorities will change. Your character will change, right? You will need to repent. There's sure enough things you're doing that you probably need to stop doing. There's sure enough things that you don't want to do that you better start doing, right? And so there's a lot of things that are going to have to change in your life. And so there's a relevant message in that. But we go back to Matthew chapter 13, and I say that you know this is a relatively harmless way to teach this point um, because, well, I don't I don't know that I should say you know it's never really harmless to to deal with scripture in a not accurate manner, okay? But um, but my point is you know in Matthew thirteen forty four can we say that that's what this is about? An individual who finds Jesus and gives up everything to gain Christ. Is that what this parable teaches? What's the problem? Okay, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the problem is this. If that's the way we're going to teach this, you need to explain to me what's the treasure and what's the field. Right? If, if, if this is about a man who finds Jesus... And, as well, and, and it's so valuable, he's willing to give everything up. You know, a man found a treasure hidden in the field. So what's the treasure and what's the field? So anyway, my point is, you know, when you actually start following these parables, a lot of the things we hear all the time, boy, it just doesn't mesh up very well. It doesn't seem to fit, right? And so, and then again, he finds Jesus, he gives Jesus up. And then he comes back and, and buys the field so he can have Jesus. Like I said, you've got to figure out what the field is. You've got to figure out what the treasure is. And so those are, those are important things. Well, let's, let's kind of break it down. What's the field? Well, we're in Matthew 13, so let's pay attention to the other parables. The field is the world. It's the same field that the seed is sown in. It's the same field that the tares and the wheat are, are, are sowed in, right? And so it's, it, that, that seems to be consistent. Um, what about the man? Okay, well, um, is it the Christian? Well, let's, do you have to buy, does the Christian have to buy the world to find a treasure? Okay, we'll come back to the man. Um, well, we won't come, let, here's the deal. The, the man can't be you or me, it can't be the Christian. And here's, here's one of the reasons why. What means do we have to acquire the prize? See, what, what we're talking about that's so valuable, you and I don't have anything worth we're, that we could buy it with, right? We, we get it backwards. Jesus has got to be the man in this parable. 
Jesus is the one that pays everything to buy a field, right? The world, in order to obtain the treasure that's in it. Is that starting to make sense? Okay, so let's, let's, let's kind of break this down, okay? If, if, what, what do you think the treasure is? Well, let's, let's go back. There's this idea about the treasure. We've hit on it in our tabernacle class. We hit on it in the Malachi class. We're going to talk about it again now. All the way back into Exodus 19. And we've got to think about the timeline here. What, what, what's happening in Exodus chapter 19? What's about to happen? Okay, in chapter 20, right? Pretty, pretty pivotal point there. Uh, we, we get the law, the covenant comes into play, right? And so God is, in chapter 19, it's, it's, a, it's a cool chapter to read because, you know, God is introducing Himself to Israel, to the Hebrew people. And... He's, he's getting them set up there to consecrate themselves and He's preparing them for what's going to happen. Uh, you know, explaining to them about, you know, we're going to start this covenant and you're going to be my people and I'm going to be your God. And So anyway, this is what He says. This is the whole kind of the, the, the precursor to, to the Old Testament covenant here. He says, Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. Now, I'm reading out of the New American Standard. And, you know, the, the, the phrase, my own possession, that you see there, okay, is actually, it's a peculiar treasure, is how that, that I mean, my own possession works, but it's, it, it, it's a peculiar treasure is how the King James continues to translate that and is consistent with. And so I, I do believe that's a, maybe a better translation of this. And so the idea is, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you will be a peculiar treasure, my own possession, among everybody. Right? So among the whole world, right? He's talking to the Old Testament people. And now there's, there's a condition... Right? It's a conditional statement. If, right? If's a pretty big word when we find it in the Bible. Um, the, the conditions are you obey my voice and you keep my covenant. Okay? And, and then, you know, then you shall be my possession among the people. So I want you to understand that in Exodus, when this is being written, this is not a guarantee. He is not trying to say that the Old Testament Jewish people are the treasure. He's telling them that there are requirements. If you want to be this, this be my treasure, if you want to be my possession, you're going to need to keep these commands. You're going to need to keep, uh, keep my covenant. Obeying my voice is going to be important, and you need to pass this on to your children. And then, you, you know, one day, you'll be this treasure. That's the idea. The, the, the phrases are repeated. Okay, if you turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7... Of course, Deuteronomy is the second telling of the law, so it would make sense that this, this, uh, this idea will be repeated again, but Moses is getting the people prepared to enter the promised land there. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, okay, we see the same thing in verse 6. He says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, the Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His own possession out of all the people who are on the face of the earth. So again, we see this idea out of everyone in the world, right? The field that, you know, we're, 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 uh, that, you know there's this, this opportunity here for you to be this, this chosen people, this peculiar treasure, right? This valuable treasure in the midst of the world. Okay, and we see it again in Deuteronomy 26. 18 and 19. Deuteronomy 26, 18 and 19. When you're there, say, got it. <laughs> All right. The Lord has today declared you to be His people, a treasured possession, as He promised you, and that you sh should keep all these commandments, and that He will set you high above all nations which He has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God as He has spoken. Okay, so again, my point is we see this idea that God was from the beginning here wanting to create uh, a people. He's looking for a people who are going to what? They're going to obey Him. They're going to keep His covenant. They're going to be holy to the, to, among the people of the world. And this is going to be this peculiar, uh, special um, treasure 
among the world. Okay, and so uh, we see this consistently uh, throughout the Old Testament text. We go to Malachi chapter 3. Okay, and again, we just got done with this Malachi class. Um, so you may remember this. Malachi chapter 3. Now, you know, Malachi is kind of the last word, right? It's the last message from God for 400 years. Um, you know, if you think about what we went over in that class, we see how, we see how distorted God's system of worship and service to Him became over time. We, we're dealing with a corrupt priesthood. Uh, we're dealing with a corrupt people because their, their spiritual leaders are corrupt. Uh, we, we see in all these problems, but we get this idea that there's still hope for them. And look what it says here in Malachi 3, 17 through 18. They will be mine, says the Lord of hosts. On the day that I prepare my own possession, what do you think that is translated in the King James? Yeah, when, the day I prepare my peculiar treasure, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve him. And so let's, let's look at this verse for a second. The first things out of God's mouth here is they will be mine. Now what should that tell us? Not yet. I mean, that, that should come to a shock to these people because what they claim is we're God's. We're God's possession, right? We are the descendants of Abraham, right? We, we belong to God. We are special because we have the temple. We're special because we have this covenant with God. We're special because we have the law. We're special because we have the, the sacrificial system and the tabernacle and the priesthood. And we've got all of these things and that makes us better and it's more special than everybody else. And God's looking at them saying, you're not mine yet. You're not acting like it, right? And so they will be mine when? On the day that I prepare my own possession, right? The day that he prepares this peculiar treasure, that's when they can be his. But what's, is, there, is there still an if in this? Yeah, they're still going to have to serve him. They're still going to have to be holy to him, right? They're, they're still going to have to be obedient to him, right? So all these ideas come together. And so here's the deal. We see the same phrasing... In 1 Peter chapter 2, okay, in the New Testament, right, we've got all these capital letters showing us that these are quotes from the Old Testament, and we just read where they're quoted from throughout the Old Testament. And Peter says, and he is speaking to Christians, you are, man, we talked about this in our tabernacle class almost every week we brought this verse up. You are a chosen person race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. How do you think that also can be translated? Matt, you got it? That's it. A peculiar people or a peculiar treasure. It's all the same idea, right? And so a people for God's own possession, a peculiar treasure, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so, here's the idea. Is that throughout the Bible, God is working to produce a people that are going to be this treasure, right? That are going to be set apart from the rest of the world. And did He accomplish it through the Old Testament? No, right? And, and, and you've got to see that in the, in the text Right, they will be mine. Well, they weren't. They weren't in Malachi, right? Even in Exodus, right? If, right, then you shall be one day, right? This is looking forward to the future. This is almost a prophecy, if you want to call it that. Uh, but, but it was up to the people whether they could be a part of this. And so, you know, by the time we get into Peter, though, it's not an if anymore. You are. Right? So we didn't get there through the law. We didn't get there through the sacrifices. We didn't get there through the priesthood. We didn't get there through the temple. We didn't get there through any of the prophets. But we get there where? Through Christ. Right? And so through Christ, we, we can become this peculiar treasure among the world. And so, what is the peculiar treasure? It's the church. It's the church. It's Christian, right? It's, it's His kingdom. Okay? That's the treasure. You know, it's the you are versus you shall be. Okay? This is not future tense. If you're in Christ, 
you are that treasure, right? It's not, well, maybe one day if you work hard enough, you are. That's the idea. And so, you know, there is, uh, you know, you are this peculiar treasure among the world. The Christian is that treasure. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. When you're there, say, got it. All right, you don't even know what verse we're going to yet. Verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God, not from ourselves. We're afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, not despairing, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, not destroyed, always caring about the body, the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Was that accomplished in the Old Testament? No, well, you do enough sacrifices to make that happen? Go to the temple often enough that, that you could represent and manifest the life of Christ in yourself? You know, one, of the, one of the fallacies of the Old Testament law was that it was not able to change people. It wasn't able to produce godly character inside of people. There was no transformation of the inner man. There wasn't any putting away of the old man of sin. None of that could be accomplished under the law. Right? Only in Christ can we see those things accomplished. He takes this treasure. He puts it in an earthen vessel. What do you think the earthen vessel is? It's us, right? And what treasure does He put inside of us? Yeah, the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of the Christian, inside of every Christian. And so, you know, there's, there's value in that, right? There, we are valuable to Him. And, and, you know, you think, well, how many Christians have that attitude today? How many Christians have a defeated attitude today? Well, I'm no good anyway, right? I'm not valuable just same as I've always been. You know, I hear that a lot. I hear people say that a lot. They say, well, I'm just like everybody else. I've just been, I've just been saved. I'm no different. Is that true? Man, in Christ, I'm a lot better off than I was. Right? Being a part of the kingdom that He died for. Having the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in my life. Right? Being plugged into the Word of God. Being surrounded with a fellowship of like-minded believers week in and week out. These things make my life better than they were. I better be better off than I was before I was in Christ. What, I mean, what's the selling point to the world if what we're telling them is, look, you can come in here and be just as miserable as you are out there, but we're going to require some commitment from you to do it here. Wonder why people aren't as interested in it today. You thought about that? What we need to be selling to people is the fact that Jesus works, right? That that life can improve. I'm not talking health and wealth here. Paul still went through a lot of suffering and persecution that could have been avoided had he not been a Christian. But he says it's worth it, right? And the Lord's looking at church, at, at, at his people, at Christians, at the kingdom, right? And it's worth it. And so the idea in this parable is that the man found a treasure in the world, right? What did he do? He, he had to buy the whole field. Right? Well, how did Jesus buy the whole field? Yeah, on the right. In John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of a few. Nope, how many sins of the world, right? So Jesus paid the price for the entire world. Now, does that mean the whole world's forgiven and going to heaven? No, right? But he paid the price for the whole world. For Why? For the few who would find it, right? The few who would seek it. The few who would obey it. John 3, 16, God so loved the world, gave his only begotten son, right? And so that doesn't benefit the whole world. I, it, it's always kind of blown my mind that people will... I, maybe I shouldn't go on the rant. Anyway, you know, sometimes you get people that are all like, you know what, you need to calm down a little less. Uh, you, you need a little more love in your sermons, a little less of the fire and brimstone kind of stuff, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and you know, and it's like, like John 3.16. Is that a good verse or is that, a, is that a bad verse? Well, I mean, it's all the Bible. It's all good. Maybe that's not the way to word that. But is it, is it an uplifting, encouraging verse or is this a verse that's going to get in everyone's grill? Sounds awfully encouraged. That's why you see it at the football games and on the parades and people don't have a problem putting it on their t-shirts and coffee mugs and things like that. Who's this verse of bad, bad news for? If you don't believe, what does this verse mean? You ain't going to make it, man. Right? Yeah, if you don't believe, this verse, John 3.16, condemns you. Right? And so, you know, is it, is it fire and brimstone or is it love? Depends what side of it you're on. Yeah. 
Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the next three or four verses, very condemning to a world that prefers the darkness to the light. Yeah. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but anyway, the point is that he pays the price for the whole world, right? Pays the price for the whole world. He uh, pays the price to redeem the whole world in order to preserve those in the world who would come after him, who would seek him, who would obey him, who would keep his covenant with him. And so, in that sense, he bought the whole field in order to gain the treasure within it. Now, I believe this answers a, a question that I get asked a lot by, usually from people that are not going to church, and they'll kind of use this as, an, as, as maybe an example why I don't believe in God or that sort of a thing. You know, why would God keep fooling with this lousy world? You ever heard something like that? You know, why does God, you know, I mean, all the bad things that are going on, why didn't God just end it? I've heard this a whole bunch. If God doesn't hurry it, hurry it up, He's going to have to start apologizing to Sodom and Gomorrah. You ever heard that? <laughs> okay. Um, so why, why is it that God would let the world keep going? Why is America still here? This is worth thinking about for a second. Why? I'm sorry? Okay, well, for one, God is not willing for any to perish. Did you say because of Joe Biden? <laughs> he, you know, you need to publicly repent. <laughs> oh, is that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what? Okay, well, I think it's worth considering. When, okay, when, when God looks at our country, for example, and, and, and let's, let's, let's move on the, you know, we, well, this is, a, this, well, this is not a Christian nation. You all understand that, right? It's, it was founded on, on godly biblical principles, but nations don't become Christians. People do. And, and you know, so <clears throat> as, as long as there are Christians in this country, God has invested interest here. You see what I'm saying? There's a reason to preserve things here when there's Christians here, okay? And you, you think about how valuable that is, right? Because if there's Christians here, what does that mean for everybody who's not? There's hope here, right? Because God's got people here that are supposed to understand the mission and the work that we're supposed to be doing, right? And so it, it, God has invested interest in making sure this kingdom continues to flourish in this area. And I, I really believe, you know, when you look, well, let's go back to, to Sodom and Gomorrah, right? What was the argument between Abraham and God? Would you really destroy, you know, even the righteous and sweep them away with the unrighteous? And God, God's willing to negotiate a little bit on this, right? Okay, Abraham, let's see if we find, you know, we got down to what, five? <laughs> we can't even find five? And so, this, you know, those nations are gone. But what if he did? Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them would have remained standing. You, you see what we're saying? And so, you know, I, who knows? Maybe, maybe this group right here is the only reason this part of the country is still standing today. Right? Wherever you go to work tomorrow, are, are you the only Christian in the place? Maybe. Maybe that's the whole reason that company still, still has business. God's making sure that you still have a job, that you've got some, something to do. You, you see what I'm saying? We don't know how far this goes, but, you know, there's a very real possibility that the small faithful few in this country is the only thing keeping it going, right? And as soon as that, that we forsake the Lord, why wouldn't the Lord just tear it all down and start over over here, you know? But like I said, you don't know how far that extends, you know? What's the Lord doing with your family because you're there? You know, what's the Lord doing with your workplace just because you're there? You know, don't underestimate the value of one Christian in your community, in your home, on your street, in that workplace, you know, God's got you there for a reason. Who knows what you're capable of there, okay? Um, there's treasure there. God sees treasure in that place if you're there. And so, um, all right, let's, uh, I don't, we're going we're gonna to break a little early because we're going through three parables and I don't know how else to break it. We're either going to have to break late or break early. We'll break early. Let's do that. All right, uh, the costly pearl, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, sure, I got this. Yeah. Uh, so 45, 46, he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. 
Let's talk about the pearl for a minute. I don't have any first-hand experience with the pearl. Um, I would assume that a pearl's pretty... Well, I, I don't find them valuable to me. <laughs> Could you imagine me with a pearl necklace up here tonight? <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> Just, Pearl handled revolver. That's better. I like that. I'll have to wear one of those next week. So, uh, yep, <laughs> yep. That's true. That's true. Well, nothing's stopping us now. Huh? <laughs> you know? So, all right. But anyway, pearls though highly valuable. A lot of people, you know, uh, invested in them. Um, thing is, like in, in Jesus' day, the value of the pearl far exceeded what it is today. Okay, and that's hard for us to. To, to understand. Um, in in Jesus' day, the, the pearl was the most valuable gem in the world. Okay? If you owned a pearl, you owned a fortune. I mean, you, you were well set. And again, it's hard for us to imagine. Who in here, I mean, is there any, any, any ladies in here that own any pearl jewelry, uh, necklace, uh, earring, anything? I mean, well, we're getting to that. Okay, we got fake ones and we have real ones, okay? Um, very good. Well, here's the thing. In the, in, 19, in the 1930s, we learned how to mass produce pearls by farming them. Now, this is still what we would consider today a real pearl, but it's not the same as, as a pearl that was found before the 1930s. Okay, and so right now you all just a, a real one or a fake one. We're not talking about the difference between a real one and a fake one. Even a real one today has some value. Okay, but we're talking about before 1930s, the value of a real pearl that wasn't farmed or that wasn't mass produced was the most valuable gem that you could get a hold of. And so natural pearls today, not, not real versus fake, but natural accounts for Less than one one thousandth of a percent of the pearls that exist today. Okay, of the real pearls that exist today, a natural one is less than one one hundredth of a percent. I don't. How would you even write that? How many? Look at that. My wife, she's a mather and a mather. She's a math wizard, a math a magician, and I didn't get into. I can't math too good, so or or speak. <laughs> They don't, they don't. So anyway, but anyway, so that, that's the idea. Now, to, here's the deal. To obtain a natural pearl, okay, to find one, that's the idea. You can't make it, right? You know, a natural pearl can't be farmed, so you have to find it. And so you have to actually look, and it was extremely dangerous work. So a valuable pearl was not something you would find walking along the beach somewhere, right? I mean, you wouldn't just be out for a stroll, you know, uh, enjoying the sunrise and, oh, there's a valuable pearl. That's not where you found them. Okay, in most cases, the oyster that would produce a natural pearl lives in depths of the ocean that are not accessible from the surface. So you have to be between 40 to 100 feet deep in the water to find the oyster that will produce a natural pearl. And so, now, today... I don't want to go diving 100 feet off into the ocean somewhere. Uh, but if I did, there is equipment that can assist me in that. In Jesus' day, they did not have the air tanks and the scuba diving gear and the GPS and the flashlights that work underwater. And all of those things did not exist. So you have to imagine without masks, without lights, they didn't have waterproof torches, you know, without air tanks, jumping into the water, finding a way to get down 40 to 100 feet deep, and then searching in the dark for the oysters uh, and coming up to see if one of them has a pearl in it. The way they did this, if anyone's been around water, it's actually, someone told me the other day, uh, I got a friend that likes to, I go fishing with and he can't swim. And, um, and anyway, I mean he can't swim at all. He bought a swimming pool. <laughs> and uh, he's... It, yeah, but he still can't. He does like, I can't swim. So anyway, and we like to fish and we go over by Markland Dam sometimes and the water's pretty treacherous on, uh, you know, on the, uh, the treacherous side of that. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And uh, anyway, and I'm always like, he's going to die. You know, that's <laughs> what's going to happen because he's hanging over the boat, can't swim. Anyway, and I was talking to him like, well, you can float, right? He's like, I don't float. I'm like, what do you mean you don't float? Like, it's, it's hard to sink. 
right? If you're in the water, you have to try to sink. Like, you know, I understand people not knowing how to swim, but most people don't just sink like a rock. They, they were pretty buoyant, right? And apparently he's not. <laughs> yeah, 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 most, most. So, but anyway, you know, in Jesus' day, these guys had to get down, you know, and like I said, it's hard, it's hard to sink down. So they would tie rocks to themselves, right? And then they would jump in and then hold their breath and they would go, you know, down and jump off the boat, scour the mud for as many oysters as they could before they ran out of air, dump the rocks and try to get back up before they die. And so dangerous job. A lot of effort goes into that, right? A lot of risk is involved. But the reason is because a natural pearl, they would maybe find one in every 10,000 oysters they brought to the surface. And so an oyster is considered, a natural oyster is considered, not an oyster, a natural pearl, thank you, is considered beyond price. Like it's hard to put a price tag on a natural occurring uh, pearl from an oyster from the, that hasn't been farmed or mass produced. And so, um, you know, in, in ancient civilizations, you know, Egypt worshipped the pearl. Rome did as well. They, they, they worshipped it like a god. At the height of the Roman Empire, there was a Roman general that financed an entire military campaign by selling one of his mother's pearl earrings. Could you imagine? We're going to take out all this Middle East problem. We'll sell an earring to fund the whole thing. You know what I mean? Like that's how they did it back then. Um, Cleopatra, there's, this, there's, there's a famous um, wager that she, she put on. She said that she could give the most expensive dinner party in history. She had an empty plate, a cup of vinegar. She dissolved a, a, one of, a pearl from one of her earrings or a necklace in it and drank it. And uh, historians today assume that, that that drink that evening was worth about $10 million. Okay, and so anyway, point is, it's, it's beyond price. It's hard to put a value on an, a natural occurring oyster or a pearl and we just like I said we don't we don't we don't get that today okay the bible references its value you know matthew chapter 7 and verse 6 we're told to not throw our pearls to swines uh revelation 21 right we always refer to the gates as pearly gates okay um so there's pearls there you know we see that so so anyway uh, so that's the idea so in this parable the merchant the kingdom of god is likened to a merchant looking for such a pearl. That's the idea. So he's a merchant that he's looking for uh, the pearl. So it says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls and upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Okay. So who's the merchant? The merchant is not us because we have nothing to buy what we're looking for with. You see what I'm saying? We don't purchase Jesus. We don't purchase our salvation. Uh, we, we don't have any, you know, there's not a, a trade, a transaction that takes place there. Not that there's not requirements to salvation. We have to put our life in a place where Jesus can deal with it, right? I mean, we have to take our sins and put our sins in a place where Jesus can, can wash them away. We, we have to take our life and put it in a place where it's humbled before God. You know, so those things are required, but that's not the same as a transaction as us purchasing or earning something. And so the merchant that's searching for valuable pearls is Jesus. Luke 19.10, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. So, <clears throat> now, here's the thing. There's this price that's been paid to obtain the pearl. And I, I want you to understand, you know, you can look at this in a couple ways. What Jesus is looking for and what we should be looking to be a part of is the same thing, right? I mean, it's the kingdom. It's, it's, it's Christianity. It's what Jesus died on the cross for. And, and so our, you know, we're not searching. The pearl isn't Jesus. The pearl is, being a, is the kingdom, right? It's those who are in the kingdom, and, you know, one of the things that's important about this is, is this, this merchant didn't accidentally find it, right? It's not like, you know, he was stumbling on the beach and ran across an oyster, cracked it open, and thought, look what I found. He's intently looking for it. He's seeking it out, right? And so this is deliberate. This, this, is, uh, this is intentional. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a big difference than just, oh, look how lucky I am at what I found, you know? And so you know, searching the whole world over for something that's valuable, but Jesus knows what it is he's looking for. You, you understand that? So in this story, this merchant, his business is finding pearls of great value. So, you know, when Jesus is looking for, for this treasure, this, this pearl of great price, the point isn't that he's just looking, he's not just looking for the most valuable thing he can find. Jesus knows what he's looking for. 
right? You know, we're told there, you know, we've got a parable that Jesus is going to come back and when He comes back will the Son of Man find faith? Like, does Jesus know what He's looking for? Who's the author and perfecter of faith? Yeah, so, you know, when, when it says He's looking for the faith, He's looking for the faith and He knows what that looks like. Right? We can't fake Him. We, we can't imitate that in some way. I mean, we, we're either we're legitimate and we're going to be in the faith or we're not. And He knows what He's looking for. This merchant knows what that, this pearl of great value would look like. He can identify it when he sees it. And so he's intently looking for it. And you know, one of the things that, that's important about, about your search, and this is a lesson for every one of us as a Christian, as people who are a part of the church, you know, the effort that you put into finding something, okay, is, is equivalent to the value that you place on the something you're looking for. Okay, so for example, okay, if you lost your wedding ring, you might diligently be looking for that. You'll put a lot of effort, you know, maybe that's something that's very valuable to you and to your spouse, and so you'd put effort into that. If you misplaced your leftovers from last night, you may not necessarily turn the entire house over and uh, not call and call into work for the next couple. I just saw that. He's like, I don't know, leftovers, you know. <laughs> but uh, you, you see what I'm saying? So, you know, the, 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 the effort, you don't search for everything equally. Okay, and so when we think about the effort that we're putting into our Bible study, our prayer life, you know, the fellowship that we have, what kind of effort are we putting into the kingdom? It depends on how valuable we find the kingdom. You know, and, and there's, there's a lesson in that, you know, when, when we look at church, because churches all the way across the board struggle with, with attendance problems, with, with giving and finances. And I mean, those things are pretty much universal problems everywhere that I've been. And so... Um, so that's fine, you know, and there's some different ways you can try to handle that. And I learned a long time ago that, you know, if, it, like if people don't want to show up, you know why they don't want to show up? Because they don't want to show up, <laughs> right? And so preaching on how they need to be there doesn't change that. They still don't want to be there. And if people aren't giving, you know why they're not giving? They don't find value in it. They don't want to. They don't think it's value. They, there's other things they'd, you know, and so preaching that they need to give isn't going to change that. You, gotta, you have to change what's important to them, right? And so if, if, if they're living the kind of life where they, they, they need Bible study and they need to be in fellowship and they need to be fed because we're busy working and serving the Lord and, and, and you know, then they're going to be there. You know, they're not going to miss out. Right? If they understand the value of, of, of financially uh, investing themselves in the Lord and His work, and then they're going to do that and, and you don't have to, to, to hark on them about it. You see what I mean? Like you want, and you know, if you have kids, you understand this. Like you, you want your kids to do what they're supposed to, but there's a big difference between them doing it because they understand they, they, they should do it and that there's a benefit to it and you making them do it, Right? I know with my kids, like, it's never enough that they do what I want them to do. Like, it needs to be done with the right attitude or we have to go back and revisit this again, you know? And, and you, you can see that maybe, well, you know, uh, you can see that in, in, in food, okay? Everyone always says, well, Grandma's got the best cookies. Secret ingredient is, oh, it's love. You ever ate a, a, a meal where love wasn't a part of it? <laughs> Where it's like, I don't want to do this right now and we got to get out the door and so here's the quickest thing I can throw together. Shove it down your gullet and we're out the door. Okay, that doesn't taste the same as the meal that was prepared with love, does it? Attitude makes a difference, doesn't it? You know, and so in the church, you know, when the Lord wants to spit some of us out of his mouth, it may not be because what we're doing isn't right. It may be the attitude that we have when we're doing it, you know. And so anyway, the, the, back to the point, you know, what we're doing um, is, is, you know, the effort that we're putting into this that's equal to the value that we find in it. And so you know, the preachers out there, you know, if we're struggling in our congregations, push the value. Why this is important. Why, why we need to love the Lord more. Why, why we, you know, rather than pushing the, the work, push the motivator behind it. You know, something to think about. I'm not going to sit here and suggest that I've fixed all of those problems and found all the answers. But if you do, let me know. <laughs> Um, so anyway, Jesus is putting in some effort here. Okay? He knows what he's after. And when we talk about the price that he pays for what he obtains, we understand that this is the, the value that he finds in the church is, is tremendous. Right? It's, it's not just a valuable thing. It's the most valuable thing to him. And so um, you know, what, what kind of price is paid to obtain this pearl? It's the same price that's paid for the treasure. He, um, it's, uh, it's, he sold all. 
right? So that's the price. It's all. And so that was what was paid for the treasure, for the field. That's what's paid here for, um, for the, uh, <clears throat> the pearl. I keep wanting to call it an oyster. And I caught it that time and then ruined it by explaining that to everybody. Okay. All right. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's turn there real quick. First Corinthians chapter 6, uh, 19 and 20. If you're there, say, got it. You all beat me. Okay. <clears throat> Do you not know that your body's temple, the Holy Spirit is in you, and you have from God that you're not your own, for you have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God uh, in your body. Okay. Hebrews 2, 9. You know, Jesus was brought lower than the angels, suffering uh, you know, through the death, and he tasted death for everyone, right? So there's, there's the price, right? It's, he gave all uh, to, obtain, to obtain the pearl. That's, that's the price that was paid. Now, th there's a couple things here that are worth thinking about, um, you know, with the significance that, that we already see, you know, established in the, these, these pearls. There's this tremendous value in it. Understand that this par parable is not about a merchant that's necessarily... Um, you know, it, it's about a merchant that was seeking the fine pearls, right? So this is his way of life. And so, do you think this is the first time this merchant's ever ran across a pearl? No. And so, but, so if, this, if his line of work is, is in pearls, and then he finds one that is more valuable than everything else, and he gives up everything to obtain it, what do you think everything might also include? All the other pearls, Right? So, you know, if I've spent my whole life obtaining mediocre pearls, but I can trade all of those for one great pearl, right? That's what we see going on here. And so, you know, the, the, so he discovers this one rare valuable and he's willing to give everything. Everything must also include, among other things, perhaps what other pearls he already had obtained. Here's the point. The value that Christ sees in the Christian, to understand it, to appreciate it, we need to understand the price that our relationship with God, our fellowship with the Lord costs. Has God had dealings with mankind prior to the church? Yeah, and so this, this can kind of help us understand the perspective of the value of what we have. In the Old Testament, Israel, right, uh, was supposed to be God's treasure, His peculiar people, right? Holy among, among all the other nations was the goal for them. Now, Here's the thing. Did Jesus Christ die or lay down His life so that Israel could be a part of that Old Testament covenant? No. Not the same price was paid, was it? Okay, you know, they were not purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. He was not the sacrificial lamb for what took place on the mountain in Exodus chapter 20 in the book of, uh, or, you know, on, on, on Mount Sinai there. The Lord did not pay it all to obtain that. And so when we, you know, we, when we talked about this in that tabernacle class, and the, the Hebrew writer brings it up over and over again, it seems like the push through Hebrews is, look at how important this was in the Old Testament. Don't you realize that it's even more important now? Like, look what value the Lord put on this principle in the Old Testament. Now that Jesus has died for this, don't you think that, the, that we should be more committed to this, not less? That we should have more respect for this? not less, that we should be doing even more with our faith than they did, not less. And so this seems to be over and over again a significant point. And I think about this all the time as the priesthood. You know, what, what a, what, you know to, to, to know that it was your day to be a part of that, to enter into the holy place of God, to offer service and worship to God, and to know that your whole life was supposed to be centered on that. I mean, how many of those guys do you think just called in sick? Well, I don't think I'm going to make it today. Well, I've got, you know what? I'll do it, but we got a family reunion this afternoon, so maybe next time, you know? I mean, that wasn't going to happen. And then here we're a part of something that Jesus died for, and what does it take for people to give it up? Almost nothing. I mean, you know, we're weighing it on the scale, and it's like, well, how important is this, you know? And so it's, it's really worth thinking about. Jesus talks about this in Matthew chapter 11, in verse 11. He says, Truly I say to you, among those born of woman, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Let's stop right there for a second. Of all the people born of woman, who does that include? Everybody, okay? <laughs> Everybody, right? So of everyone that's ever been born, right, uh, up to this point... Who was the greatest? 
John was the greatest. Man, put that on your resume, right? I mean, hey, no, you know, it's only been, you know, 4,000 years, but I happen to be the best, (laughs) you know? Comes right out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. That's pretty impressive. And then what's he say? Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is even greater than him? Well, who's in the kingdom of heaven? Every Christian. That's me and you. Well, I'm not much of a Christian. You're greater than John. (laughs) Well, I'm not much of a preacher. You're greater than John. Well, I'm not much of a soul winner. You're greater than John. And he was the greatest man that ever existed up to that point. Why would you be greater? Well, how about this? Jesus died for you. Right? You have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You, you are a part of the church right? that Jesus purchases with His own blood. How much of that was John a part of? None of that. Church wasn't established yet. He died before he got to see it. He never got to have the Holy Spirit in his life indwelling within him. He never got to be a part of those things. So greater is even the least in the church. And like I said, we've got to see the value of who we are in Christ. So many Christians are walking around with this defeated, you know, oh, I'm just no good and I can't do anything. The Lord doesn't see you that way. You know, I, I, I'm all for being humble. We should be humble for sure. But, you know, we should also agree with God <laughs> you know, and the Lord, you know, puts us, you know, puts value on who we are in Christ. Not because of me, but because I'm in Christ, right? There's value in that. And so what a tremendous thing. You know, John never partook of the kingdom. Uh, John never partook, partook of what Jesus died for on the cross. And here, you know, we are in the kingdom, right? We are part of that. And what a tremendous thing. And so even the least in the church, man, is greater than John, which means also greater than who? Well, like Noah? What about Moses? What about Joshua? What about Samson? What about, yeah, the, the, he whoever's in the kingdom, man, is greater than all of those. Because John topped the list. And we're greater than John. See, and so, you know, it's... So the Lord was willing to give up all the other pearls, you see, for the one that was, that was worth more. Matthew 13, 16 through 17 puts it this way. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What does that mean exactly? How many of them were looking for it and never got to be a part of it? What was it that Job said? I know my Redeemer lives, right? I mean, you go through that book of Job and Job constantly is saying, if only someone would stand between me and my God, right? If only someone could go between me and God. I know I have a Redeemer. I know there's an advocate, but Job knew that he wasn't going to be here during his lifetime, right? Job desired to have what we have. Never got to see it. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. talking about Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, 13 is where we're going to pick up. When you're there, say, got it. All these died in faith without receiving the promises. Well, wait a minute, what promises? Were they looking for physical promises? But having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. As it is, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them." What was Abraham looking for? I mean, he left Ur, right, with Sarah. All the, all the journey, everything that they went through, right? All the trusting in God, all the mistakes that he made, all the picking himself back up and moving on, for all of that for what? He was looking for something. It wasn't the land, right? It, it, wasn't, the, it wasn't the acreage out there where he could uh, have his livestock and his servants on. He was looking for a country that was built, a city that was built by God. 
We'll go to Hebrews chapter uh, chapter 13 or chapter 12. Verse 22. But you have come to Mount Zion to the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem to myriads of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood excuse me which speaks better than the blood of Abel the church has come we've arrived not will be this isn't future. This isn't one day I'll die and then I'll see the sweet by and by. If you're a Christian, you have arrived in this Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God. You have made it to the heavenly Jerusalem. What is it? It's the church. It's the kingdom of God. And we have arrived. Not future tense. We're, we are enrolled in heaven. We are citizens of this kingdom. Man, that's a powerful mess. That's what Abraham was looking for. That's what all these patriarchs were looking for. Did they get to be a part of it? See, they died way before they could be a part of it. And so we're told in Matthew 13, blessed are your eyes because you see it, your ears because they'll hear. Many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see. If you think Abraham could come back and be a part of the church right now, do you think he'd act like most of our Christians today? We laugh because we, we know. They would, they would appreciate it. They would understand the value of what we're doing and what we are and what we're to be a part of. And shame on us for taking it for, for granted. right? Shame on us for the lack of commitment and seriousness and devotion that we put into these things. There's another lesson about this pearl. Every other valuable gem on earth has to be cut and polished and dealt with by men a pearl a natural pearl especially when they found it it was perfect as is don't have to be cut doesn't have to be formed or shaped i mean it was perfect as it was matter of fact any involvement by man only devalues the pearl the church is perfect as it is jesus established it he died for it. He says, upon this rock I'll build my church. Not whatever rock you want. It's the rock he established. Any attempt to man to mess with it makes it worthless. Well, we'll try a man-made plan of salvation. It's nothing now. All right, well, we'll set it up our way. You know, that, was, you know, that Bible stuff's a long time ago. It's, uh, it's not relevant anymore. Long time. You know what's funny about that? I read back in the Old Testament, I read God uh, giving some rules about things like the Ark and the, the, the Ark of the Covenant there and you know, you're not supposed to look into it and how you're supposed to carry it and all those sorts of things. And you know, it was almost 2,000 years later, a man named Uzzah reached out and touched that thing when they were carrying it on, an, on a cart and that guy died. Oh God, that was, you wrote that so long ago, that can't still be relevant. Right? You can't, you can't seriously mean that anymore. You know, we upgraded. We're not doing the poles. Right? We're going to put it on this ox car. We saw the Philistines do it. They got away with it. You know, we do the same thing with the church. Uh, we're going to run it our way. We're going to run it like America. <laughs> we're going to run it like a, like a democracy. Everyone's going to have a vote. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to do all of those sorts of things. You know, we're going to improve upon the church. What do we do to it? And we make it worthless, man. We make it worse. Any involvement, that, that, any way that we try to improve it makes it worse. Takes away the value. <clears throat> Christ didn't come to earth to minister, die on a cross in some reluctant fulfillment of duty. Okay, we need to understand that also. He humbled himself. He took on flesh. He endured harsh treatment. He pours out his blood. Why? Because he considered our salvation and what we're a part of. He considered that 100% absolutely worth it let's look at the dragnet I think we can do this tonight Jesus picks up there in Matthew 13 <clears throat> and uh, verse 47 through 50 there it says again the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind 
And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers. The bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so here we see the kingdom you know, uh, is, is likened to a dragnet that is cast into the sea, gathering fish of every kind. Uh, again, this parable is being spoken to the disciples after the crowds have left. Uh, Jesus found you know, four of these disciples while, while fishing, right? And so you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, so at least those four for sure are very familiar with the process that Jesus is talking about. So let's kind of talk about the dragnet. Um, there's several different kinds of nets that are used when fishing. Uh, you know, there's the dip net. So that's when you've actually caught a hog and you're hauling him up out of the water and you've got to get, get that thing into the boat, you know. So that's, that's when you use the, the, the dip net. Um, I use a cast net to catch bait. Anyone here ever thrown a cast net before? Okay. Uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to bust yourself in the head with the lead weights. But, you know, that's where you, you throw that thing out into the water and it sinks and you, 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 tie, you pull it in and, uh, and then you empty it out. And, you know, it's a good way to catch small fish bait. I, I mean, I've seen when we were in Australia back in 2019, I saw a guy throw one that was like 20 feet spread. And How big a one can you throw there? That's me. I'm right with you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, if I'm lucky. <laughs> so anyway, it takes some talent to throw any bigger than that. But I've never seen one bigger than, than, than I think, you know, maybe 15, 20 feet. And that may be exaggerating. So um, the dragnet is different than all of those. And so we get the, um, the Greek word. I don't even know how to pronounce that. But it's where we get the English word like a sign net. And so has anyone ever used one of those? Or a sane? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we used to use these in the creeks to catch, uh, catch bait and minnows and stuff like that when I was a kid. My dad and my brother and I would go out and, you know, it's got the sticks and usually just like tobacco sticks put on either end of the net and some, uh, some weights on the front. And you you uh, kind of go through, you're almost scraping the bottom and, uh, you know, eventually you pull up and what you got is what you... We always knew it was done when dad found a snake. <laughs> He wasn't afraid of them. He swears he's not afraid of them. But as soon as we saw a snake, we're done. We got enough. Like, Dad, we got like two. Like, no, nope, that's enough for tonight. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, that's the idea. When we talk about a dragnet, this is like a very big version of one of those. And so these, uh, these would literally drag along the sea. And so they were often 200 to 400 feet long. And so they were very, very large. And what it did is it would sweep the bottom of the sea. And so it's, it's, uh, it's very different than our typical methods of fishing for sport today, you know, where you're trying to attract a fish with a bait and lure and reel, that sort of a thing. Um, because, you know, when, when you're fishing today for sport, like if you want, you use a different bait for a catfish than you would a bass, right? You use a different fish for a bass than you would for a muskie. And so you, you target a specific fish today with a specific sort of bait and lure, that sort of thing. With, with these nets, you aren't targeting any, you're targeting fish, okay? That, so you just want to get stuff in the net. That's the idea. And so, you know, it, it didn't attract a specific kind of fish. It, it swept up whatever it got in its net. And so they would, um, you know, you would catch the fish along with debris. Uh, anything that you would sweep up in the net would come out in large quantities. And so in, in Jesus' day, like commercial fishing, they'd usually drag these between two boats, and so they would actually drag along the sea uh, and then the net would be hauled to shore and then the fishermen would go through the net on the beach and they would collect the good fish and then they'd throw out the bad. Now they didn't throw the bad back into the water because they don't want to catch them tomorrow. You know what I mean? They would just throw them out. And so they would, they would die. A lot of times they'd be just in a pile rotting, that kind of a thing. And so good fish would be gathered and kept uh, fishermen would often dispose or burn the undes undesirable fish to avoid catching them again. <clears throat> so, that's the idea of the dragnet. I thought I had a picture of the dragnet. Nope, I don't. Okay, well, in this parable, you know, again, first off, remember, the kingdom is not like 
whatever comes after that noun. Okay, you know, it's not the kingdom is the kingdom is not a dragnet. The kingdom is being compared to a story that has multiple parts to it. And so in this sense, uh, the net is the gospel message. Okay, and the sea is the world. That's the idea. Okay, so the, the net is the gospel and the sea is the world. The idea is that the net does not hone in on a specific target. Okay, now I see this all the time, and, and it always, it, it really does bother me when I see it. I see churches trying to target a specific demographic. You ever seen that? Or I've seen preachers or people in ministry that are only there to minister to a certain demographic. And that always bothers me. It's like, well, I'm, uh, I, I only work with, uh, you know, this age group, you know, these kinds of people, you know, that sort of, what, what is the problem with that? You're leaving out everybody else. And, and look, I get it, you know, uh, if, if I only wanted to share the gospel with people like me, I, I would not be, I'd just sit around talking to myself all day, for one. But the other thing is, you know, in the church, like this group right here, like if we took Jesus out of the picture, there's probably no reason on the face of the earth for all of us to ever be in the same place together, ever. Right? I don't know what we all have in common. I don't know why our paths would ever cross, but because of the Lord, we have in common something more valuable and more lasting and something that will tie us together better than anything else in this world ever could. Right? And so we have real relationships that can exist because of Jesus Christ. And so if I'm going to only hone in on a specific target, I miss out on all of that. Right? And we also miss out on the opportunities to make a difference with a lot of people that otherwise we, we could have made a difference on. And so anyway, it always really bothers me when I see, oh no, <laughs> um, I don't know. Hold on. Got it. <laughs> so that wasn't so bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, so anyway, but the point is, you know, the, the, the gospel was not intended for a specific target. It was created for everybody, right? The church, the kingdom is open to anybody who will receive it, who will accept the plan of salvation, who will humble themselves before God, who will repent, who will be immersed in the watery grave of baptism, who will continue to live faithfully, and anybody on earth can do that, Right? There's not one person who, who can have a legitimate excuse for why they can't be a part of that. It doesn't exist. And so the net is the gospel and it does not make, it's not able to make a distinguish or a distinction between what it catches. Right? That big net that's dragged through the sea, it didn't get to say I'm only going to get bass today and uh, we're not going to bring in any catfish or, you know, or you know, that didn't work that way. Whatever got in the net, got in the net and then it was sorted out later. Okay, and so the gospel is for everybody. Now, similar to the parable of the soil, right? What kind of soil did the seed get scattered on? Not only the good soil, but also on three other soils that produced less than desirable results for the farmer. Okay, and so, and we stressed in that parable that the sower is not responsible to ensure that the gospel takes roots and produces fruit. Our job is only to make sure that the gospel is being spread. And so the gospel needs to be preached like a dragnet in the sea. Our responsibility is to preach it. And every individual caught by the message of the gospel must be personally responsible for what they do to that, how they respond to that, whether they're going to be obedient to it or not. And so, you know, I know, I think we've mentioned this before, but, you know, for John chapter 1, Verse 6 and 7, speaking of John the Baptist, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. I love this verse because it, I, it constantly reminds me of what my job is. John, what was his goal? Yeah, what, what, if, if John's successful, what does he do? He, yeah, he broadcasts. He's the town crier, right? I mean, he's Paul Revere. Jesus is coming. You all need to hear the message, right? If he's successful, he shares the gospel. Okay, that's it. Now, so he came as a witness. His job is to testify about the light. 
so that all might believe through him. I love that word might because it is not up to John whether they believe it or not. The goal is we want people to believe it, right? The, the hope is that people would believe it, but it's not up to the preacher or the one proclaiming it to determine whether people believe it or not. The preacher can only preach it, right? The proclaimer can only proclaim it. John could be the test. He could be the witness. He could testify about the light. He can't make people believe, right? But what happens if he doesn't testify? What happens if he's not the witness? Yeah, people can't believe, right? They don't get that option anymore. So it's his job to make sure that people are, are able to do that. And so in the same way, you know, the net is the gospel message, the sea is the world, and the fish, that's everybody that gets swept up in the net. Okay? Now, don't hear what we're not saying with that. The, that that's not everyone who becomes a Christian. It's just everyone who gets swept up in the net. So that includes those who hear it, and accept it, those who hear it and don't accept it, right? It includes the sincere alongside the hypocritical. It includes the true believers, right, who continue in His Word, and those who, who are, would be false believers and don't. It's those who bear fruit, and it's those who do not bear fruit. The separation, okay, represents the time when the net is pulled out of the water, and each fish will stand in judgment, Okay, and so let's look at the continuity of these parables. In the parable of the sower, good soil is in the same field as three soils that don't produce fruit. And the wheat and the tares, the tares grow in the same field right alongside the wheat. And the hidden treasure, the treasure remains in a field where it was found. There, that's a good parable to use against the rapture idea. Okay, because the church isn't taken out of the field, okay? It's left in the field, okay? We are left, we are here in the world. Dragnet, the good and bad fish remain together as the net is sweeping the sea, okay? So we see that idea. And so one of the lessons here is that there will both be wicked and righteous until the end of time. The sorting out will take place during judgment when the angels come forth to execute the judgment. That's there in verse 49. And so, um, but, but, but here's what I want us to think about. The gospel will draw all sorts of people out. I mean, can we find accounts in the Bible where people are drawn to the gospel for not necessarily sincere motives? We have warnings all over the New Testament. Let's turn and look at a couple of them. Turn to Philippians chapter 1. And uh, we're going to look at verse 15. So when you're there, say, got it. You all make me look bad. I'm going to wait and ask you that after I'm already there next time. And I'll be like, well, when you finally catch up with me, go ahead and say, got it. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, first, or Philippians, first Philipp I guess it is first Philippians. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. Look what it says. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. Okay, there are going to be people that get swept up in the gospel for the wrong reasons? For sure there are. Yeah. Okay, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. You there, Chris? <laughs> I, thought, I thought I heard you say God. Who said God? Okay, we got it. Well, I'm, I'm almost got it. Chapter 6, boy, you know, we could be, we could be in this all night talking about this. Um... You know, we're warned here about, you know, those that are um, going to be causing, I don't know, all this false issues within the church and people with depraved minds using the gospel uh, for their own gain. Um, yeah, I don't, you know. Uh, yeah, look, look here in verses 3, 3, 4, and 5. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he's conceited, and he understands nothing, but he has a morbid interest in controversial questions, and disputes about words, out of which arise envy, strife, abusive language, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of depraved mind, and deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. 
Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3 uh, verse 13 says, Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 4 talks about when they will not endure sound doctrine, but will heap up accord, you know, in their own uh, you know, accordance teachers that you know, will tickle their ears. And so the, the point is that, that the gospel will, you know, lots of people will respond to the gospel in different ways. And so the net is sweeping the world. Not everybody caught in the net is going to be a Christian. Not every fish in the net is a desirable fish, is a good fish. And so that's, that's an important idea. But it's not us who gets to determine that. The Lord gets to determine that. Uh, but, but it's real important that we see that not all within the net will be saved. Okay? So it will be at the end of the age the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It doesn't matter how much Bible that we've heard or how much Bible that we've read. It only matters what we've done with the Gospel. Okay, And we're going to see that time and time again throughout these parables. It doesn't matter how closely associated or, or what kind of fellowship we're in with the faithful if we're not faithful ourselves. And, uh, and so what does it... What, well, you know, what makes a good fish? I like to have it fried and breaded and yeah. <laughs> what makes a good fish? Good heart? Well, that's all I got. What makes it, <laughs> we're we're done. Yeah, well, let's let's close out. Well, oh, do you think it might be the same thing that makes a good tree or a good plant? Sure. Yeah. And so, you know, it, you, like I said, we go through these parables and we see that there's, he's talking to, the, to, to us. He's, he's not necessarily trying to show us the separation between Christians and the world, but he's, he's, he's trying to make sure that we understand that we are up against a lot. There is so much that's going to be pulling on us. There's so much deception in this world. There's going to be, you know, it's not like we can just go out and serve the Lord without any opposition. There's constant opposition. But we can't get discouraged because the day's coming where, you know, the Lord will sort all of this out. And so we just need to make sure that we are the good fish, that we're the good soil, that we're producing the good fruit, that we're the, the, the produce of the right seed, that we're the wheat, that we're not the tear. You know, over and over again we see this. Um, but understand too that Christ finds tremendous value in His church and He knows the difference. Hear this. He knows the difference between His church and those that just sit in a church building. Right? He can see the difference in that. And so one day... The net's going to be drawn in and, and our time to respond to the Word of God is going to be up. And it's going to be no different than with the time of Noah. The, the doors are going to be shut. right? If we're not responding to the Word of God, if we're not letting that seed produce what it's supposed to produce in our life, we will be cast aside. But preacher, I was baptized. That's great. Did you walk in a newness of life? I mean, what did you do after that? I mean, it's not about where you, you know, did you make that decision? It's what did you do with that? Did you produce the right fruit, right? Did you, did you let the Word of God continue working? You know, the Word of God should motivate you to do more than just be baptized. Now, it should do that too, right? The Word of God will lead you there for sure, but it better lead you beyond that, you know, and that's, that seems to be where we have, have uh, well, where we're falling short in a lot of ways. All right, so don't lose heart. Don't grow weary. Um, as uh, you know, it's easy to look at the church through carnal and fleshly eyes sometimes and say, "Boy, we're just not making any headway," and you know what we're doing's not uh, not being successful. The Lord looks down and sees something very, very valuable here tonight. And when He sees you being a Christian in your home, He sees you being a Christian at work. He, see, you know, He's looking at that treasure that that He He purchased the world for. And so, you know, don't, don't lose heart in that.